An Old Testament reading from Isaiah 18, 13 through 15. But the Lord of hosts, him shall you honor holy, uh, honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Our sermon passage from Mark 12. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, and dug a pit for the winepress and built a tower, and leased it to tenants, and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Good morning. My name is Jamie, one of the pastors here. This is your first time visiting. An extra warm welcome. We're very glad that you're here, and uh, we're in a series looking at the Gospel of Mark, and we're at a stage in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus is now in Jerusalem, and it's what's called Holy Week or Passion Week or the final week of uh, Jesus' life. So here we're looking at what's called the Parable of the Wicked Tenants, and it's a very pointed story, and it's showing the unbelief and the rejection that the people had toward Jesus being the Messiah, the Christ. Now, imagine you're at a social gathering. So you're at a social gathering, and you see people sitting together, and they're beginning to talk, and someone begins to tell a story about a person who is unbearably rude, okay? And as the offensive deeds of that person are being detailed, everyone is listening because their their, their curiosity is piqued. After all, we all love gossip. And we love to hear about other people who are, quote, bad. And so you, too, begin to listen, and you're listening with interest. And then you begin to seethe. Why? Because then you realize they're actually talking about you. That's a similar scene of what's going on here in the text. Uh, Jesus is telling a parable, and it's a very pointed story, and he's directing it toward the religious leaders there in Jerusalem. And uh, the Jewish leaders, they're following along with this story, and they're following along with great interest until they realize that Jesus' words are actually about them. After the parable, uh, Jesus gives a very clear warning. He says, beware of rejecting me as the cornerstone, or I will crush you. He says, beware of failing to make me the foundation of your life, or you will stumble and fall. He says, do not reject, instead repent. Bear fruit, in other words, bear obedience unto God. So our big idea today is this. The big idea is uh, because Jesus is our cornerstone, we are to bear the fruit that is due unto him. We're going to get at that through four points. Uh, The four points are rather quick and short. First, we're going to look at the story. Then we're going to look at the implication. Then we will look at the reaction. And then lastly, 
the warning. Uh, Before we go further, would you please pray with me? Lord Jesus, here we are again. Um, It's Sunday. We're at Cornerstone. Uh, For some, this is their first time at Cornerstone, and we're excited about that. And this is a time when we listen to you through your holy word. And so, Father, make my words to be your words. But also, would you wake us up? Would you stir our hearts that we would not just hear these words, but that we would actually do the words that you put before us? So, Lord Jesus, would you be glorified right now? We pray in your matchless name. Amen. Amen. All right. So first, the story. Here is the context. Um, Again, this is what's called Passion Week. So this is the week just before Jesus is going to die upon the cross. And Jesus has come with a purpose. He's come to Jerusalem to actually die. And he's going to die upon the cross. And so we've already seen that he's cleansed the temple. You remember that? That's when he drove out all the moneylenders, the merchants, and the leaders were offended. Um, Jesus was challenging their pride. He was challenging their greed. He was challenging, really, their corrupt way of worship. But then the leaders, they challenge back, and they come to Jesus and they say, by whose authority are you doing these things? So then Jesus begins to tell us a, a series of parables or stories, and today we're going to look at just one of those, and that's the parable of the wicked tenants. So just a brief overview. Jesus says there's a landowner, and he plants a vineyard. And at great pain, at great lengths, uh, he does all that it takes to make this to be a very successful vineyard. Uh, The time for harvest comes, and the owner sends his servants to gather the fruit that is due to the landowner. Now, there's a bit of a shock in this parable, this story. Uh, The tenants beat the owner's servants, and then some they even kill. And so then the owner says, finally, I'm going to send my own son. They will respect him, or to put it differently, they will give to him the fruit that is due. Now, there's a greater shock. The people say, let us kill him as well. And so they do kill him, and then they throw him out of the vineyard. And so then Jesus asks a question, and he says, what will the owner do to the tenants of that vineyard? And it's a, rather, it's, it's a rhetorical question, it's obvious, and it's not recorded in the book of Mark, but it's actually recorded in the book of Matthew, uh, the same incident, and the people cry out and they say, put those wretches to a miserable death. In other words, let evil come to those evil people, let justice come to them. Now back to Mark in verse 9, he affirms their answer, and he says, yes, when the owner comes, he's going to destroy the tenants and he's going to give the vineyard to other people. Now, it's a simple story. It's very simple, but it's very loaded. So let's look at the implication. So point number two, the implication. Look at verse 12. So here there are the religious leaders, and the religious leaders, they hear what Jesus is saying, and look what it says. They perceived that the parable was told against them. So what's the meaning of this parable? Let's work through this. Well, the owner of the vineyard, that is God the Father, and the vineyard that is planted by God the Father is Israel. That is his kingdom, if you will, on earth. Now, when Jesus calls Israel a kingdom, he's actually referring um, a couple you know, very known or popular passages. One of those is um, Psalm 80. In Psalm 80, basically it's saying, you know, Israel, you're like a vine. You're like God's vine. Here he says, you brought a vine out of Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it, you cleared the ground for it, it took deep root and it filled the land. Now another very popular passage that Jesus is inferring or making reference to is Isaiah chapter 5. There it says, let me sing a song for my beloved, a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it. He cleared it of stones. He planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, 
but it yielded wild grapes. So these would be inferences that the people would understand. Now, when we see that the owner goes to another country, listen, this does not mean that God is somehow going on vacation. Um, keep in mind, this is a parable, all right? And so in the parable, you have an owner. The owner hires some servants uh, to really tend to what he just planted. It could be an owner with a business, if you will. And he's then going on to his next project. That's why he's going out of town. So this is very normal. What's not normal in the parable is what happens. The servants and even the son are thrown out and killed. Now, if you follow Jesus in his parables, every story tends to have a twist, kind of like a catch, something to in, engage you, to go deeper. And so right here, the question is now being asked, well, why are they killing the servants? What's going on with that? So let's look at who these servants are. The servants are the prophets. These are the messengers of God's word. Um, another way to think about a prophet is they are covenant lawyers, uh, covenant prosecutors. Uh, if you remember, God is one who entered into a very special relationship with his people, and it's called a covenant. And God said, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people. And God binds himself even at the expense of life himself. He says, May it be unto me if I do not provide for you, if I do not save you, if I do not bless you. May it be unto me even death if I fail my faithfulness to you. Now, the people on their part, they were to honor God, they were to obey God, they were to serve God. And so one of the functions of the prophets is not just only to deliver God's words, but also to hold the people accountable to that covenant relationship. And so when the servants, the prophets came, they were saying, look, have you served God with all your heart, soul, and strength? Have you obeyed him? Where is the fruit of being God's people? Those are the servants. Now, who is the son in this parable? The son is actually Jesus. The son is the son of God, the, pro the promised Messiah King. And so here is Jesus, and he's saying, look, I'm the one to whom you must listen. Do not reject me, because I am the son. Now then, who are the tenants? The tenants, well, look at what Jesus says to the people, particularly to the religious leaders. Jesus says, you are the evil tenants. You are the wicked ones. Uh, you are trying to be the owners of this vineyard, but guess what? You're not. Remember, you are tenants, you are servants, you are the hired hands. Put it differently, you are the covenant people. You're to be living by the covenant. You're to be showing a fruitfulness in your life, but you're not. You have been unfruitful servants. And when you are unfruitful servants, it's not just that you're rejecting the kingdom of God. Listen, you're rejecting the king himself. But these are hard words. And this parable, uh, as Jesus tells it, he reminds them that they have a history of rejecting God's people. Um, throughout the history of God's people, God would send them prophets, and the prophets would come, they would announce the word of God, and often what they would do to the prophets is they would harm them, and some they would even kill. Just think this through with me. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Jezebel, the uh, queen over Israel um, with Ahab. And what did they do? They killed all the prophets. And if it were not for the faithfulness of one of the servants named Obadiah, who hid a hundred of the, uh, the prophets, they would all be dead. This is how they treated the prophets. You can even think of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet, and he was beaten. He was put into stocks, publicly shamed. In chapter 38, of Jeremiah, we see that he was thrown into a well, and there he was left to die. Simply, what was his crime? He preached the word of God. Now, the implication here is very severe. Jesus is saying, look, you would murder God himself if somehow you could get your hands upon him. The implication is, people, you think you're the owner of the vineyard, and you're killing everyone, everyone who gets in the way. So that's the story. That's the implication. 
but what's the reaction? Look at verse 12, see how it continues. So they perceive, <clears throat> excuse me, that Jesus is talking about them, and then it says they want to arrest him. In Luke's gospel, it goes a little bit further, it says they want to kill him. So they want to kill Jesus, and it's ironic. They're angry over a parable of how they want to kill God, and then they seek a plan to kill God. But it says there at the time they did not uh, try to arrest and kill him because they were afraid of the crowds, and so they're going to wait on a different time. In other words, the crowds, it says, were hanging on every word of Jesus. And so they knew if they were to grab Jesus, the crowds would turn against them. Now, as we look at that reaction, I think a way to kind of get at this is, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically retell the parable a little bit, and let's see how we respond. So if you're kind of feeling a little bit groggy, wake up, um, and I want you to hear this parable. So there's a volunteer organization. And in this volunteer organization, it had a charter. In other words, it had a vision, a purpose. And the purpose was to help the community become a better place. Okay? So you have this volunteer organization, and it has a mission or a charter, and it says, I want to help this community become a better place. So part of that visiting is to, part of the charter is to visit the sick, to go to those who are imprisoned, to care for the widow, to care for the orphan, and to provide for the poor. Uh, this nonprofit, this volunteer organization, is to promote the value of people, and part of the charter is to seek to serve the people in the community. Now, the CEO, they have a CEO in this particular, you know, volunteer organization, and the CEO, he calls a meeting. And so he calls a meeting and he says, you know what, I think we're too inward focused. Um, we think of ourselves more than what we're thinking about others. Basically, we're going against our charter. If you remember, we are those to whom much has been given, and so it only makes sense that we should be giving much to those around us. And so as we think too much about ourselves, we're violating what we're all about. Now the members, they hear this kind of rousing talk from the CEO, and they resist. Some begin to have excuses, and they say something like this. Some will say, you know, I really want to do more for this, you know, volunteer organization, but I'm just too busy. I just can't engage at this time. Another person says this, you know what? I thought someone else was going to do the work. I really thought that someone else would be doing that. And yet another person even says, you know what, um, to the CEO, you're the hired one. Uh, you should be doing all of this work. Um, yet another person says, you know what, I'm doing the best that I can. That's understandable, right? Don't you get it? And yet then another person says, it's just a volunteer organization. It's just a volunteer organization. And so the CEO, again, he reads the charter. He says, do you see what we're supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be making a difference in our community. And he warns them of being marginalized, basically saying, look, if we do not engage the community, then why are we even in the community? What is it that we're really called to do? And so the members, you know, they say, well, I understand, but we really need to focus on ourselves before we focus on others. And they justify and they say, you know what? It's more important to know our charter than to actually do it. So the CEO, he becomes angry, he resigns, and he finds different members to do the work of that organization. Now, as you hear that, What's going through your mind? Some of you are saying, okay, I get it. It's a parable about us, right? How cute of you, pastor. But some of you are saying, I have some really big questions about what you just said. Some of you are saying, is Jamie saying he's the CEO or is God the CEO? And if Jamie's the CEO, that's awfully arrogant. And then others are saying, you know, if you're saying God's the CEO, that's awfully blasphemous. 
How dare you talk that way? But also, how dare you imply that we're not doing enough? We're not that bad. We're trying. We're trying. And so now, perhaps some of you are saying, I actually, I'm offended by that. Jamie's no better than us. Is he threatening to resign? Let's get him. Let's fire him before he resigns. <laughs> now, you might be thinking, no, okay, wow. I'm not sure if all of that's going through your mind. I'm really not, and I'm trusting that all of that is not going through your mind. But what's the point? Our sinful selves are what? Our sinful selves are offended. We are offended whenever there's any form of confrontation over our character, over our doing, our lack of doing. See, when Jesus is telling this parable, he is intending to offend the people. Think of any time that we're accused. Any time that you're accused, what's your immediate response? The immediate response is something like this. Who are they to say that? Who are they to call me out? They're far worse than I am. Think of any time that you're accused and then you say something like this. There's no truth in what they're saying about me. Think about any time that you are called out. Even if it is true, they are worse than I am, and so how could they ever talk about me? You see, we justify our anger. We seek to protect ourselves and our reputation that somehow we really are far better than we could ever imagine. Jesus is telling this parable, and friends, and I do say that as friends, we need to allow Jesus to offend us. We need to let Jesus actually strike us because it's not just, you know, maybe there's some truth about what Jesus is saying. It's, listen, how is this true about me? You see, just like the Jewish leaders, we want to be the owners of our own lives. We want to be the owners of the vineyard. And guess who's the owner? God's the owner. We're just tenants. And God as the owner says, where is the fruit that is due to me? Think about this. Any time that we are successful, any time that we can say, you know what, I did a good job, the immediate reaction is, man, I did it. That's me. I did it. But who gave you the talent to do it? <laughs> who gave you the lucky break to do that? Who gave you the creativity? Who gave you the intelligence? Who gave you the education? See, everything that we have is from God the owner. We are but tenants. And yet we are those who are constantly wrestling, saying, God, I must be the owner. Think about this. How do you use your time? How do you use your abilities? How do you use even your money, your wealth? Often we use it for ourselves. We say things like this. It's mine, and I can use it any way that I want to. But we're just tenants. And as tenants, we are to give all glory to God. The story is about him and not us. And so my time, my abilities, my money, everything that I am is for God, the owner, and not for me. Now, someone might say, you know what? But I do all things for God. See, I'm one of those people who I avoid sin. I go to church. I tithe. I do serve at that volunteer organization whose charter is to make the community a better place. I do all of that. Can't you see how good I am? When you say, can't you see how good I am, it's still all about you. Basically, then you're saying, God, look at me. God, I am in control. Do you see how much I have done for you? I am the owner of my life. See, we even use religiosity to say, God, I don't need you. Friends, in our natural heart, in our sin nature, or the flesh, that's how the Bible calls it, it is in us to hate God. That is striking. It is in us to hate God, and friends, that is in me. That is in you. And Jesus is offending us and even perhaps scaring us, saying, am I really the wicked tenant in that parable? So let's look at the warning. Our fourth point, we need to listen to Jesus' words about those who fail to obey the Son 
about those who reject him. Look at verse 10. Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Here Jesus is quoting Psalm 118, and Psalm 118 is written by David. And David is saying, you know what? He's rejected by his people. David's even rejected by his own family. And yet he rises in preeminence. And so Jesus is basically saying, I am the greater or ultimate David. I am that Messiah King. Um, Matthew's gospel goes further in this incident, in this warning. And Jesus goes and he, he, he further warns about rejecting the Messiah and his gospel message. In Matthew 21, verse 43, he says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when anyone falls on it, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Jesus is actually referring to Daniel chapter 2. In uh, the Old Testament, there's a prophet, and his name is Daniel, and he has a vision. And in that vision, um, he sees this giant statue, and this giant statue represents four kingdoms. And so it represents like the Babylonians, uh, well, first the Babylonians and the Persians, uh, and then the Greeks and the Romans. And um, in that weird kind of vision, there's a stone. And then the stone comes, and it's like a small stone, but it's a powerful stone. And in the vision, that stone crushes all of that statue. Literally, it crushes that whole kingdom and kingdoms following. And so it ends the vision that this is a stone that's not cut by human hands, but it's this divine stone. And then it says the stone becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth. Now, the Jewish people at that time would have known what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying, I'm the stone. I'm the one who's crushing you. I'm the one who's crushing these kingdoms. And he's saying, this mountain is my kingdom. Basically, what he's saying is, look, you need to receive me as the Christ, as the Messiah. You must be part of my kingdom or you will be crushed. You remember last week, last week we were talking about there's two kingdoms. There's a kingdom of this world that's passing away, and Jesus' kingdom is coming, and it's growing, and it's the ultimate kingdom. Jesus is making reference right here. He's saying, if you're not part of my kingdom, you will be crushed, because the kingdom of the world is coming to an end. So let's take this home. It's easy to say that Jesus is your Messiah, but how do you know if he really is? It's easy to see that you follow Jesus, but how do you know that you really are following him with your whole heart? The Bible says you know by looking at your faith and your repentance. Faith is not just having a right knowledge about yourself and God, but it's having this right knowledge and doing it. So in regard to you, sin is not just an action that you have. Listen, it's an attitude of your heart. It's the hate that's within you. It's real. It's there. And so in your natural self, it's not that you just do some wrong things. Apart from God, you're hating God because you love yourself. And so faith is saying, Jesus, when you went to the cross, you were the one who was crushed for me. I deserve to be crushed because of my rejection, because of my rebellion, because of my living for myself, for saying I'm the owner when I'm not. And so the good news is that the hate that God has for your sin of hate was put upon Jesus to pay the, full, to pay the full penalty of it and to bear it all. And so faith is believing this. And it's not just believing it, it's trusting it, saying, Jesus, you did that for me. And when you believe in that way, the Bible says you're filled with the Spirit and you are a new creation and the hate is now replaced with love. And self is now replaced with God. But there's also repentance. Repentance is not just turning to Jesus because you know you're a little bit curious about him. It's turning to Jesus in obedience. 
Repentance is basically saying, Jesus, you are the king, and what is your will for me? And so I'm going to do what you want over what I want. Jesus, you are the king, you're the owner, uh, you own this vineyard, what fruit should you be having from my own life? And so to examine yourself is to say, am I unfruitful? Are there sins that I'm still holding on to? Is there rebellion? And so obedience is not to show that you're saved. You obey because you are saved. Remember, the, the kingdom is a gift. And because this kingdom is such a gift, it's given by grace, I did not earn it, I did not deserve it, there's nothing I can do to get it on my own, but Jesus gives it to me, and so now I work hard for the kingdom because I want the whole world to know about this. I work hard because the kingdom is worth it. Again, there's great irony here. The religious leaders, Jesus tells them that if they reject him, they will be crushed. And instead of taking the warning to heart, they seek to arrest him and kill him. They actually fulfill the very words that Jesus spoke. Today, do not let that irony come upon you. <laughs> Today, if you're hearing this warning, respond rightly. Respond by not having hatred, saying, God, how dare you accuse me? How dare you offend me? That's unbelief. Unbelief is saying, Jesus, that's not me. That's someone else. Unbelief is saying, Jesus, I'm okay. I don't need you. The warning is, you do need him. So be broken by Jesus in the sense that you're humbled, that he has exposed your reality of sin, that you do need him. Faith and repentance is that Jesus, he covers all of your sin. He's the stone who was crushed for you. He's the one who has borne the guilt and the curse so that you might have life. Jesus is now your sure foundation for all of your life. And because he's the cornerstone, let us bear fruit unto him. Would you pray with me? Jesus, you are the stone that was rejected but you now are the cornerstone. You are the true king. There is no other God but you. Help us to see that there is no neutrality with you, Lord Jesus. You say that we will either love you or we will hate you. We will either follow you or we will try to kill you. So today, would you give us a fresh faith to see that you were crushed for our sin? How amazing is your love. Give us a fresh repentance to see that we are but tenants and that our lives are to be lived fruitfully unto you. And when your word convicts us, we're the prophets, may we not reject the warning, but instead may we be changed by your word and live by your word. All to your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we come to the table.